Hello, I want to talk to you about my sword. This is the Thai Dab. It was made close to here in Lampang in northern Thailand by Buntun Sidipasan. I hope I haven't mangled that too badly. The Thai word for sword is Dab. It's spelled in the Thai language this way. It's usually transliter transliterated like this. However, it's not pronounced darb. There's no R in the original word. Uh, in fact, it's not pronounced dab. It's actually more like dab. The B is unreleased. Uh, which is interesting because the Burmese word for similar sort is da. And I'm not familiar in the Burmese language enough to say that correctly, probably. So, um, that's it. Um, it's interesting because the Burm... Burma dominated, um, occupied Thailand for many centuries. So there's obviously lots of cultural uh, exchanges, especially regarding weapons. Um, of course, China also did a lot of trade, and uh, it's no surprise that the Chinese Dao looks a little bit like this. Enough with the linguistics. On with the sword. So let's look at the sword. The scabbard is made out of wood and it's bound with some sort of natural fiber. And I confess I don't know the identities of either of these. But now look at this down in the handle. It's also bound with the same natural fiber and it's got a good grip to it. That's not a problem. It's really well chosen for the purpose. Looking further at the scabbard, you can see there's a suspension system. A little bit ornate here. But you can see it has actually the ability to be adjusted in length. From what I understand, it's okay to carry it like this, or possibly like this. Probably individual preference, in different periods in history, and different locations, they have different ways of doing it. Um, considering what they would wear, uh, typically in old Thailand, this would be perfectly appropriate. Anyway, let's dispense with the scabbard and move on to the sword. Now you notice, coming out, it doesn't bind up too much inside the scabbard, although the blade is narrower here than it is over here. So it's pretty well designed for that purpose. Um, it's fairly sharp. And uh, seems to be all well made. You can see his, I hope you can see his maker's mark right there. Right about there. There you go. I think he's using some old Thai writing. Um, furthermore, this copper, um, I'm going to say Sepa, is intriguing because. The, the uh, smith has actually learned how to make um, good enough Japanese katana so you can sell it to the Japanese market for a decent price. So he probably copied this little... I'm not sure if this is an authentic uh, aspect of a typical dai, Thai dab. But in this case we have a, a copper seppa and then the bolster here is made from brass as it is on the scabbard. And then we, of course, have a pommel down here. Most people remark about this being a, oh, it's a two-handed sword, and actually it's only one-handed. I should say it's authentically used one-handed. Uh, the, uh, the weight of this part of the sword is not as important as the, the leverage that it provides. It's, I suppose it's kind of like the tail of a cat being much lighter than the rest of the cat, but it's actually able to Mm, give the cat more balance. Um, maybe it's something like that. I'm not sure. Well, this is the weapon. It's, I haven't weighed it. I haven't measured it. But it's, uh, it's not huge. And uh, I don't see myself using it two-handed. It's typically used one-handed. But more to the point, here's my question. 
the, the handle itself appears to be cylindrical or circular in cross section, right? Almost as if it's been um, cut out with a lathe. The, uh, the bolster and the pommel parts are also circular in cross section. We're sort of echoing that. The question is, how is it indexed? Now, indexing is a, um, if you're familiar with swords and their use and reconstruction of their use, um, most swords allow you to hold this sword and be aware of the plane of the blade and the orientation thereof while you're fighting. You can't look at the sword and say, is it correct, is it correct? You're concerned, you're concerned with other things right now. And uh, the, the orientation of the plane of the blade is important and effective for cuts. If you're hitting with something like this or even like this, there's this, it's not effective. It's a waste of time. So you've got to have it lined up with the cut. Now, other swords, I can show you an example really quickly. The katana, of course. It's got a, what they call a lozenge shaped cross section there. Or um, you might even say um, e ellipse shaped cross section, right? So by holding it, you have an idea of which orientation the blade has. So you can uh, cut and fight more effectively. On the other hand, working knives, such as this meat, have an obviously um, cylindrical handle, and it's obviously cut out with a, uh, with a lathe. See the marks there? Um, if you're cutting up vegetables or chopping up fruit or a coconut, it really doesn't matter. You can look at this how you're cutting and make sure that it's going the right direction. You're not fighting for your life there. It's a possibility that this affected the reconstruction of the uh, historical sword. Um, let's get back to the sword. Now, I've been told online that the correct uh, way of uh, wielding this is to put your thumb right back here. That way, you can sort of get a sense of which way the blade is pointing. You can, cons you can concentrate on more important things. Um, there's a couple of ways to find out about this, whether that's true or not. One is by visiting a um, a practitioner of uh, Krabi Krabong, which is the um, ethnic uh, Thai school uh, martial art for using weapons. Um, the other way is, of course, cutting something. Which one do you think I'm going to choose? And this is a milk jug, about two liters or about half a gallon. Filled with water. Let's see how it goes. We've got to cut into it, but not all the way through. We've got another milk jug I can try this on. So we're going to give it another shot. That, that quarter and half, except for the label, Meiji Resistance. So it does cut, it can cut, if you're holding it this way. I did some previous cuts a while back with just holding it like this and it was pretty chancy. There's uh, no way, but holding it like this, I really know which way the blade's oriented. But folks, that doesn't tell me everything. Do historical blades also hold, have hilts like this? Can we go to a, to a museum and see if they actually had them like this? Can I talk to a uh, practitioner of Krabi Kravong, a master of the art, and, and know for sure that it's held like this? We see uh, 
um, performers in the street doing uh, various thrilling movements with their swords, sometimes two at the same time. And uh, it's obvious that they're not uh, putting their thumb in the back of the blade. They're, uh, they're putting on a show. See, um, there's a tendency of martial arts to, um, over time, to move away from the actual combat applications. To forget how uh, it actually was in the past and to move towards something that's convenient and easy and uh, safe and um, you know photogenic uh, to practice and they lose the context. context. Um, that's, we see that often done with Asian martial arts as well as Western martial arts. Uh, we know what medieval European swords look like. Uh, we can get a good reproduction of it. But your average movie demonstrating uh, medieval swordsmanship is completely nothing, uh, has nothing to do, to do with the reality. Of course, there are people reconstructing this, and that's, uh, that's another issue. Uh, the same thing is true of the um, Japanese martial arts. We know what a Japanese katana looks like, um, but if you actually watch your average uh, anime or even most martial arts movies, they're not using them correctly. Even, even kendo is a, a lot different than the actual techniques than you actually would have seen a samurai using. So the techniques over time sometimes recede from the actual uh, historical techniques. The blades themselves sometimes um, don't track either. Um, we know the western swords sometimes experience the wall hanger phenomenon where the whole blade is made out of one sheet of steel and the same thickness is there throughout and there's no distal taper, as you'd see often in most um, Western uh, swords in museums. Uh, this sword was made by a smith. He, he, uh, they didn't use, well, I don't know exactly what they used, but they hammered it out with, with the hammer and tongs, and it does have some distal taper. There's actually some interesting blade characteristics. I'm not at liberty to handle a historical tie daub at this point anyway, we'll see what comes up. But uh, this seems to be fairly uh, accurate, but I continue to have questions about the cylindrical uh, handle, whether that's historical at all. Let's do some more investigating. Hello, I'm at a museum in pursuit of some answers. In the museum, I found some interesting artifacts which may provide some information about this sword hilt mystery. The swords in the museum are ancient, but they're not dated. But as we can see, they all have hilts that are cylindrical or have circular cross sections. I, don't, I have yet to see an exception to that rule. It's noteworthy we don't see that here. It looks like that's the pattern for these swords in general. So, in conclusion, I don't know. Uh, it looks like, um, at least so far, the four or five old swords I saw had circular section cylindrical hilts, and it appears to be a pattern. I'm not sure how they would have been wielded effectively in combat. Um, I guess the next um, next uh, step is to find somebody who teaches the old art and find out how they cut with those things. Uh, not right now, but uh, I hope this uh, voyage has been interesting. I hope you enjoyed seeing me cutting with my sword and um, I'll see you soon about more stuff here. Bye now.